name is Ye Ye Jiao, and I am the professor in the Department of Natural Biotechnology of Nanhua University. And I also the chairman of the uh, Association of Biotechnology and the Healthcare of Taiwan. And today I think that I'm very happy and have the opportunity to introduce the, our one only one uh, speaker that in person in, and presented his lecture in this conference. And today's our speaker is Dr. Sinirwasan. And Sinirwasan obtained his PhD degree in agricultural entomology from um, Tamina. Aminadu Agricultural University in India. And now, uh, Dr. Sunini Rossan uh, work in the uh, World Vegetable Center for 18 years. And this is very importantly that Dr. Sunini Rossan included uh, his research focused on the safer and vegetable production in Asia and Africa. Right. And very important and very distinguished research published also, almost 190 research. And you also obtained several awards, including the Royal Entomological Society Fellowship. And I think that it's a very, very good opportunity to introduce the Dr. Rostam. So today we talk, we talk about the role of agroecological approaches for safe and the sustainable vegetable production. Now, let, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so we can give a very warm welcome to Dr. Sir Rasan, please. Okay, good morning. So it's my pleasure to be here as a speaker in this uh, uh, international symposium. So this morning, I would quickly go through the agroecological approaches, which is an emerging concept in the recent times to improve the sustainability in the crop production systems in the developing world. So probably you might be, some of you might be aware of this gentleman who was awarded the Nobel uh, Prize for his invention on the DDT so he invented the insecticidal property of this particular compound. Uh, in the uh, late 1930s, after the World War I, uh, there were lots of issues related to the human uh, diseases which were spread by the insects. So because of the invention of this particular insecticide, the mosquitoes have been mainly controlled so the mosquito-borne diseases, including malaria, have been significantly reduced. So in order to honor this invention, the world has awarded him the Nobel Prize. So this is a significant in invention. However, it has also led to the development of the modern agriculture in the history of agriculture. So I will, I will quickly come back to this. Another Nobel invention uh, was given to Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in the year uh, 1970. Norman Borlaug was a plant breeder. You know, in 1960s, 1970s, most of the, the world was facing the hunger. So there was a deficiency for the food grains. So in order to cater to the demand in order to ensure the food security, Norman Borlaug was developing so many high-yielding wheat varieties which have been distributed to the developing countries so that the food security has been ensured. So in order to honor the, the, the uh, person who made this green revolution to happen, he has been awarded the, the Nobel Peace Prize. So he is considered the father of green revolution. So now, if we look at these two inventions, the combination of pesticides along with the high yielding varieties really led to the significant improvement in terms of the food grain production. There is no doubt in that one. However, there were other consequences of this modern agriculture, which was brought down by Racha Carson in her book, Silent Spring, which extensively 
mentioned about, mentioned about the ill effects of chemical pesticides which have been used at that point of time. So this has created a, a lot of awareness worldwide. So if you look at the key challenges facing agriculture even today, there are so many key challenges. However, some of the most important one is the exponential growth of the population, declining in the cultivable lands, declining in the agricultural population, then climate change. So these are the key challenges for the food security even today. Let me show you how. Just look at this population growth. Many countries are taking efforts to reduce the population growth. However, if you see in the next 30 years, by 2050, the world population is going to exceed 9 billion. So on one side, we are having a significant population increase. On the other side, you see the land availability over a period of time. Almost in the, in the last 90 years, the available land for agriculture has significantly declined, no matter whether it's a developed country or a developing country. Agriculture has to compete with urbanization, industrialization for its land allocation. So there is a significant decline in the availability of the land. Number three, this is the most important one. Because if you take who is actively doing farming, take any country in the world, be it a developed country like United States of America or Australia or even a developing nation like India, if you look at a majority of the farmers are between the age group of 45 to 65 in the USA. They are not youths. And the take Australia, majority of the farmers are between like 50, 35 to 60 years. The average age of an Indian farmer is 50 years. Meaning at least two generations are going away from agriculture. This is a significant threat for the food security to the globe in the years to come. And last but not the least, the changing climate the global warming. So there are so many different factors associated with the climate change. It could be the extreme drought or even the heavy downpours and the resulting floods or the pest and diseases linked to the, the changing climate. They all can pull down the yield significantly. So these are all the most important challenges facing the world today. And the another dimension of the food security is the starvation and the equal challenge is also excessive food. It's not only the deficiency of the food, it's also the excessive food. Probably we all traditionally think there is a significant number of population having less access to food, but it's not so. Today, if you look at the problem, it's the surplus food, overeating. You look at the number of people who are underweight, it's only about 821 million. And if you look at the population who are eating more, it's over 2.8 billion. So it's not the availability of the food, it is the distribution of the food. Okay. So there are so many the non-communicable diseases associated with the obesity. So the health crisis not only emerges because of the, the malnutrition, it's also because of the overnutrition. So we, we have a kind of like double burden. One is due to the undernutrition, the other is due to the overnutrition. And the most important thing, which is also heavily unnoticed, is the malnourishment. It's not the deficiency of the energy or calorie-rich food. It's the, the lack of consumption of the nutrient-dense food, like vitamins, minerals. So when we are not having access to these kind of foods, we are all malnourished. 
So there is a quite significant amount of these people living around the world. So what is the implication? Probably we might think, oh, what's going to happen with the malnourishment? If you look at these statistics, each year or each day, 400 mothers around the globe die during the childbirth due to the iron deficiency. Each day, 1400 children becoming blind because of the lack of vitamin A access. So this clearly demonstrates the need to have food and the nutritional security to the vulnerable communities around the world. So because of that reason, the World Vegetable Center was founded as the Asian Vegetable Research and Development Center, well known as AVRDC in the year 1971, 50 years ago, here in Taiwan, with its headquarters in Shenhua near Tainan. And we are a not-for-profit organization, so whatever we develop is an international public good, freely accessible to everybody around the globe. And uh, almost 15 years ago, we have expanded our mission to focus not only Asia, but also globally, including Africa. So we have renamed as the World Vegetable Center with a mission of carrying out research and development to realize the potential of vegetables for improving the health and also the income so that the, the, the vulnerable communities improve their livelihoods. So we focus on a large number of crops starting from Solanaceous crops, legumes, cucurbits, bulbariums. But the most important category is the traditional vegetables, which include hundreds of different vegetables which are quite important in a particular country or in a particular region. So we focus on so many different diversity of vegetables. So the, the focus of my today's talk is looking at the whole food system, not just on the production side. You know, in many countries, the agricultural production has significantly improved in the recent time. So they produce a lot of food grains, they pr produce lots of fruit or vegetables. But are they all ending in the plates of the consumers? This is a big challenge. This is a big question to be addressed. So the, the concept of food system actually focuses on everything, not just on the production side. It goes up to the consumer end. So it has to be also considered all the associated environment, the socioeconomic factors, the policy factors, the environmental factors. They have all should be taken into account so that the, the food and the nutritional security is assured. Okay. So the food system has to be transformed in today's context. Let me explain quite briefly. So, if you look at the 1960s or 1970s, most of the time the agriculture was here. It was aiming to increase the production and productivity, so they try to introduce a variety, they try to introduce some fertilizer, they try to introduce some pesticides, so it is mainly something to increase the efficiency of the production system. Then sub sub subsequently, People realize that there are some ill effects associated with the usage of some of the modern agricultural technologies. So, they wanted to identify something as a sustainable replacement. For example, instead of a chemical fertilizer, they try to introduce a biofertilizer, organic manures. Instead of a chemical pesticide, they try to introduce a biological pesticide. So in the level two, they try to replace a harmful input from the production system with a substitutive compound which has more sustainability. And until today, most of the agricultural programs are staying only to these two levels. They did not move beyond these two levels. So that has been proposed by Griezmann a few years ago we need to redesign the entire agroecosystem. So this morning we kept hearing about the regenerative agriculture practices. 
which is looking at the entire system, production system, not on a particular production of a particular crop. So the redesigning of the entire production system, so we look at the soil, we look at the water, we look at the cropping systems, then we look at the, the whole production system, not just a particular crop. Then even the food system has to move beyond this particular level. The reason is, unless we connect to the producer, with the consumer, what is the purpose of increasing the production? So with all the, the modern technologies, we can increase the productivity of rice. We can increase the productivity of vegetables or fruits. But if they are not reaching the consumers properly, then what is the benefit for the growers to increase the production? It doesn't bring any income. It doesn't bring any other benefits. So what is the, the advantage? So it's more important to connect to the producers with the consumers. And the level five is the global changes happening. So the, the previous presentation was clearly explaining how this iPhone Asia was taking so many different initiatives which influenced the governments at various levels to make the changes. So this is fitting here. There should be lots of socio-economic policy changes to happen so that all these innovations can happen without any obstacles, without any barriers. So, the agriculture has to move away from the traditional yield increasing focus to a sustainable focus where the producers can be linked with the consumers so the food and the nutrition security is ensured. So, it's not only a technological change, once you have a technological change, then there should be institutional change, like who is going to make available all these technologies, and then the entire systems change, which is the governments, policies, so these are all interconnected, so that the whole food system is going to change. So, how, did, how could it happen? It should happen at all the three levels simultaneously. The research scientists have to continue developing the new technologies, new varieties, that is on the push side. On the other hand, we have to work with the consumers to create awareness to go for more consumption of nutritive food. So there is a demand created for the agricultural producers. So it keeps pulling the improved production and productivity. So that's the pull side. Then the governments have to create an enabling policy environment so the system becomes more holistic and sustainable. Okay. So at World Vegetable Center, we focus a lot on food security as well as the nutritional security. So we're not just focusing on a few number of crops. We are focusing on a large number of crops. How? We have the world's largest public sector collection of the vegetables. We have more than 65,000 different gem blossom collected all over the world, covering more than 400 different vegetable species kept here. And it's not a museum. It's all live material with so many different attributes. Lots of pest resistance, lots of disease resistance, lots of heat tolerance, lots of drought tolerance. So all these things can be put into the improved varieties. So we have improved varieties fitting for the drought. We have the improved varieties with the high yielding nature. We have improved varieties with a significant amount of improved nutrition. So I talked about vitamin A deficiency and the 1400 kids are becoming blind every day. And you can very easily tackle with just the consumption of one single tomato, which is very rich in the beta-carotene. 
So the gene bank is a treasure box with so many desirable attributes which can be used to develop so many improved varieties. The other focus is to, to increase the safety in the food production. So this is very common in many of the Asian countries. Extensive use of chemical pesticides. What we buy from the market may not be safe. So then we need to develop all these alternative practices. For example, I will show you a couple of examples here. So the, the first one is the how we improved the safe vegetable production in case of tomatoes. In many countries in Asia, the farmers go for at least 140 times spraying, meaning they spray almost every day the eggplant crop for a key insect. So we developed a technology and then tested it in the farmer's field and taken them to the, the, the uh, farmer's uh, field condition. So the technology is very simple, use of pheromones, improved cultural practices, stop using the chemical pesticide, which will help the, the natural enemies to build up in the, in, the, in the field condition. So the second one is not only to develop the technology, we have to take the technology to the farmer's field. So you need to develop the proper educational material in the language that is understandable to the farmers. So we produce lots of knowledge materials in the local languages. Then we make available the technology through collaboration with the, the private sector. So the technology is becoming available within the local conditions. So the farmers can have the access to these technologies. Then finally, we can say goodbye to pesticides. So this was a real example, transformed the, the, the safe eggplant production in endogenetic plants of South Asia 20 years ago. And you can see through all these numbers how much the pesticides has been reduced, what is the, the yield and the, the economic benefits for the adopters of the, the improved technologies. And the most important thing is not only the money. The most important thing is the moment you take away the chemicals from the agricultural field, you help the biodiversity to increase in the field condition, so they take care of the pests and diseases themselves over a period of time. So when you keep using these safe technologies for a couple of years, then the, you don't need to rely on these external inputs anymore. So you build the sustainability into the system by adopting these sort of safe production technologies. The second example is on the food legumes, again, which is an important protein source in both Asia and Africa. So you have a range of insect pests uh, in, the, in the food legumes, but one of the most important problem is your pot border. Even this is a major problem here in Taiwan. So the farmers used to rely on a lot of chemical pesticides. In countries like even Cambodia, they spray four or five different chemical pesticides mixed it together and spray every week. So you can imagine how much pesticides are ending up in our plates. So we wanted to develop an alternative for the chemical pesticide. So we developed an integrated pest management strategy based on pheromone, based on microbial pesticides, and also the plant-based pesticides and using some natural enemies which can kill the insect. So we introduced these technologies even uh, into Africa, from Asia to Africa. And this technology took very well in many countries in Africa. And now, through the social enterprise mode or the farmer cooperative uh, mode, these technologies are produced and made available just in the, in the rural areas of West Africa. So it's not only to introduce the technology, but also to make available how they can be easily used. So finally, it's not only to reduce the, the chemical pesticide in your production system, it's not only to increase the production, but also to reduce the losses the moment you harvest, when they go to the market, when they go to the consumer, you need to reduce the loss along the value chain because almost like 40% of the vegetables 
are lost after harvesting before reaching the consumer. This is a significant loss. So we introduced lots of technologies which can help the, the farmers to store the vegetables or dry the vegetables and store it for a long period of time. So we introduced lots of post-harvest technologies to reduce the losses. Then equally promote the, we promote the consumption of vegetables, which we start from the young kids in the school, because the moment you build the importance of the consuming vegetables or nutritive food, they keep increasing their consumption, so you create a demand. So finally, the vegetables, they bring lots of income to the producer, to the marketer, and also to the processors. So vegetables are quite important in terms of generating income, as well as the, the job for the people. So this way, we try to address the food and nutritional security. So we work on the technological innovations, which can be high yielding, climate smart, and develop nutritive varieties. And then we increase the sustainability of the production system. Over a period of time, we decrease the reliance on the external inputs. Then we uh, reduce the food loss. We raise the awareness among the consumers, create the demand for safe produces. And then we increase the income to many actors along the value chain. So people consume more vegetables. So everybody along the value chain is benefited. So the food and the nutritional security is assured. With this, I would like to thank, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much.